Hello again everyone. So today we're going to be looking at all the Umbra cards. This video took a bit longer to put together because it turns out the Umbra cards have a lot more going on than the other factions we looked at prior did. So I had to go back and really play a lot more with them to get a better feel of how good some of these cards really are. So let's just get into this. And let's start by looking at our champion, Penumbra. So, Penumbra, he recent, well, I guess it's not that recent anymore, but he got buffed a little while ago to get some extra stats and just some, a little bit of extra nice stuff. And he still feels kind of underwhelming compared to the other champions. I, I think he is actually still kind of bottom tier as far as champions go, but let's talk about him anyway. So Penumbra, his first form architect, gives plus two capacity on the floor you summon him on, and it goes up to plus four on the third rank, and he has a hundred attack on third rank, which is quite nice. It's only used to be like 80, I think. His monstrous form goes up in capacity requirements, but he gets the most stats as well as trample. And Glutton goes up to plus 9, plus 3 on Gorge. I think this is definitely the worst form. And Architect is definitely his best form. With Max Architect, you get plus 4 capacity when you play him. So you're he essentially takes minus 1 capacity. But uh, sometimes you will get a bit make a mistake here and there. And you might mess up your play order and that can screw you. So don't do that. The Trample variant is okay, it, I mean it's fine, the real issue with it is just the huge capacity requirements. Uh, Umbra already have a, a huge capacity requirement to begin with, it makes it way harder to really get all the capacity you need, it, especially on Covenant 20 plus capacity becomes a real problem. Usually you want to put this guy on the top floor so he can do cleanup. And odds are he's just going to be alone on that floor. It's going to be very difficult to get him in a situation where he's actually got someone in front of or behind him unless you're running some ascend or descend stuff. But I think he's overall pretty decent. I think Glenn Umbra is the worst because I think this whole Gorge game plan is just not very good. And even if you are running Gorge as a primary game plan, there are units you can draft which are just better at it. The issue here is he just doesn't gain a ton of HP. The lifesteal has helped his survivability considerably, but it's just too hard to get him off the ground. Now, in terms of mixing these, you can mix them, uh, and they can mix quite nicely. Usually what will happen is you're going to either go all in on one of them or you're going to take some combination of architect and one of these two you can mix monstrous and glutton but i don't recommend it because the extra capacity requirement on monstrous kind of gets in the way of the gorge on glutton because you're reducing the capacity you have on that floor considerably usually with Penumbra, I, I found the best way to use him is just to take Architect and stick him in the back of a generic lineup because it lets you stack a lot more on one floor. This isn't as good against stat, uh, Sap Seraph, but I think outside of that circumstance, it is pretty solid. If you are playing against Sap Seraph, then you Monstrous might be a little bit better because it lets you set up a floor with just the Penumbra and have other stuff going on on your other floors. I think Umbra does particularly well against Sapser because they have the most ways to set up stuff on multiple floors. Like in almost every Penumbra run I do, I have something going on on all three floors. It's very rare that I don't because they're capacity cost is just so huge that usually you can't get by on just one floor. Anyway, I think all this being said, Penumbra is still a little bit underwhelming when we compare him to the other champions, 
but I think he is a lot better now. The, the buffs definitely did help him quite a bit. Unfortunately, Umbra as a whole is still kind of underwhelming. I, they're, in my opinion, either the worst or the second worst faction. That's up for debate, though. So, let's get into cards. Go Umbra, Commons. Actually, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Umbra is a little bit different. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about all the morsels first because to start with Umbra, unfortunately they do have a lot of built-in RNG with the morsels. Almost every card that produces morsels is going to be really RNG heavy. The Rubble Morsel is the first one we're going to talk about because it's common and Unfortunately, because it's common, you're going to get this one a lot, and that's going to screw you a lot when you don't even need the mana. Like, you really need Life Steal or Damage Shield or whatever off a of Shade Splitter. You, you play like two Shade Splitters, and they're both Rebel Morsels, and it's like, oh no. And that happens all the time because Rebel Morsel is the only common Morsel. You're going to get a ton with Shade Splitters. Which is really unfortunate. The plus mana will help us cast some of the expensive cards we'll see later on, but it's very unreliable for that. So next, let's talk about Entumbra Morsel. This one is 0-4, which does end up being relevant during the earlier fights. This can be used to soak damage by itself without anything else going on and still survive to get eaten. The plus 3 health is nice. Usually this one will go on something like a... Well, really, there's not much to say about the plus 3 health. Usually I just stick it wherever I think it's going to help me, and that varies from situation to situation. Sometimes the extra health will be relevant somewhere to keep something alive. Sometimes I'll just use it for gorge trigger. That kind of goes with all these, though. Anyway, next up we got Magma Morsel. This one's 3-1, so it does actually contribute towards the attack the turn you play it. However, the 3-1 also means it will die to spike, so keep that in mind. And when it's eaten, it gives the eater plus 3 attack, which is pretty nice. Usually, you want to stick this on something that has some sort of built-in damage mitigation like a crucible collector or something that has multi-strike like an alloyed construct etc etc that's pretty decent uh you can use this on some fights to help you with clearing backline dudes because the three attack if your frontline dude is killing their frontline dude then the three one can hit their backline dude and kill it that's nice sometimes overall this one's pretty average uh Next up, we got Morsel Excavator and Morsel Jeweler. I'm going to talk about these together. I'll talk a little bit about the ex Excavator first, and I'll talk about the Morsel Jeweler, and then I'll talk about them together. Anyway, the Morsel Excavator, it's a 2-1, so like the Magma Morsel, it does die to spikes, and you can use it to contribute a tiny little bit of extra damage as well as clearing backline dudes sometimes that can be nice and it gives plus two attack and life steal one i think the morsel excavator is just way better than the magma morsel in almost every circumstance the life steal is really going to help if your guy is surviving for two more turns in the front line he needs to be able to survive two rounds of hits for the life steal to come into play and that can be a problem sometimes. If you can't keep him alive until the end of the next round, the lifesteal won't matter because he'll be dead. So do keep that in mind. However, the lifesteal is very, very nice. This is one of the better morsels. Sometimes it's even better than a morsel miner because it can help just tremendously in terms of keeping your guys alive. And that's a huge deal sometimes. Next up, we got the Morsel Jeweler, and the Eater, it's a 0-2, so you can't really use it to absorb hits like the Entumbra Morsel. You 
really just have to put this in the back line and use it for the damage shield unless you need to absorb a hit this turn or something terrible happens. It gives plus one health and damage shield one. The plus one health is nice, but it's most most of the time it's a little bit irrelevant. So the damage shield is what we're here for. Unlike the Morsel Excavator, this one will mitigate damage the next round, and that's a big deal. However, the damage mitigation is less effective most of the time than lifesteal because if your dude's getting hit multiple times in a turn it's only gonna block the first hit and sometimes it really sucks because the first hit is something really trivial like five damage off of the winged five three guys that have the extinguished trigger so that's not great anyway it is on the better end of the morsel spectrum i think it's like the third best morsel on average but let's talk about Jeweler and Excavator together. Something I want to mention is that generally you want to stick all your Excavators on one dude and all your Jewelers on a different dude. The reason for this is because the Lifesteal and Damage Shield just don't synergize at all. If you're putting all your Lifesteal and all your Damage Shield on the same guy, then you're effectively only getting half value out of your effects on these. If you put them on different dudes, you're getting full value out of all the morsels here. On the same guy, what happens is he'll be like full HP, right? And then the dudes hit him, but the damage shield absorbs it. And then he hits and loses a stack of lifesteal anyway. So he just lost... One sack of damage shield and one sack of life seal, and only got the benefit out of one of them. So that's why you want to put your jewelers and your excavators onto different dudes. Usually, you want to stick your excavators onto something that's going to do a lot of damage or something that has a life steal. Anyway, like a crucible collector and your jewelers, they can go onto something that doesn't do as much damage or a crucible warden if that's what you're running and lastly for the morsels we got the morsel miner that's the only rare morsel and this one will come off of your higher rarity morsel cards as well as making a morsel which is guaranteed to give you a morsel miner this one's just zero one and it gives plus five plus five when you Obviously, we're just here for a stat bonus. The stat line is terrible. It's not going to absorb a hit. It doesn't do damage, but it doesn't die to spikes, which is very nice. And the plus 5, plus 5 is going to be very helpful on a lot of the frontline guys. You're going to be running a lot of good gorge units. Get a lot of value out of just more stats, like your... Your what are they called? The Shadow Eaters and the Alloyed Constructs get a lot of value out of plus 5 plus 5 on the Shadow Eaters. This is going to help keep the Shadow Eater alive as well as giving it a nice damage boost which is going to help it chunk the boss a little bit when that turns up. And on the Alloyed Construct, the plus 5 health is going to help keep it alive. Uh, that kind of goes without saying, I don't even know why I'm bringing it up, but... Anyway, the plus 5 attack on the Alloy Construct is very, very nice because of the multi-strike it comes with. So just having plus 5, plus 5 on this guy is very nice. Now, I, I have mixed feelings about the whole RNG factor with Umbra because they have a lot of RNG. And sometimes you'll get like a, a Magma Morsel that's going to die to spikes. Sometimes you'll get Morsel Miner, Morsel Excavator. Sometimes you'll get five Rubble Morsels in a row when you really need a defensive Morsel and you lose a run because of it, and that sucks. But that's just the way the clan is. Let's move on to our common cards now. First common card is Mine Collapse. So it's an X cost card. Umbra has a lot of X cost cards. I think they have. The bulk of the X cost cards. And really, now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure besides Hellhorned, who has one X card cost that's not a rail spike in the form of vent, they ha they're the only clan who has X cost cards besides their rail spike, which is interesting. And we'll get more into that later on 
when it kind of becomes more clear why this is the case. So mind collapse, you deal 3x damage to an enemy unit, and if this slays, you gain 2 ember. I think this is actually a pretty good card. Usually you're just going to be trying to cast this for 1 or even 0 if you have a upgrade on it. Sometimes 2 if you're in late game against the winged and you haven't upgraded it. But anyway, this gives you backline reach, which is something that Umbra can sometimes have dip difficulties with because they don't have a huge amount of cards that allow you to do that so that's nice it one shots most stuff in the early and mid game in the back line and if you're casting it for just one or even zero this is giving you more ember than you spent to play it which is very nice you can use this to effectively reduce the need of other extra mana stuff and that's nice usually if you can play your cards in the right order, you can set up the mind collapse so that you get to play your entire hand when you normally wouldn't have been able to. I think this is a very nice card. I usually look for them in the early game where I just start with them, which is always nice. And I take it quite highly then. In the late game, it loses some of its value because it can no longer one-shot backliners without pumping more mana into it, but still an okay card. I... Like I said, I like this one quite a bit. I usually end up with one or sometimes even two in my Umbra decks. It's one of their better cards in general. Next up is Prismal Dust. This is another X cost card. It consumes and you apply 1x damage shield. So, this one is also pretty decent. It's probably a little bit below average. It can be very good in the right setup. Sometimes you do actually end up in a situation with Umbra where you're able to produce massive amounts of mana. And that can be very nice with the Prismal Dust because then you can just throw this on a frontliner and win that way against the boss. That can be really nice. Additionally, it has some nice built-in utility. You can use it to protect backliners from sweeps or spikes and that can be really nice. However, overall the card is a little bit clunky to use. It can be kind of tough to pull off. And sometimes the damage shield just isn't that relevant. However, when it is relevant, it is very nice. Think of it kind of like worse sap, essentially. Because the damage shield is pretty good for defending your frontliners. It's pretty good for defending your backliners. Well, I wouldn't say it's worse sap. It's different from sap, but kind of fulfills the same purpose. Usually this ends up going in my deck if I have backline units that I really need to protect, or I have a lot of ways to generate mana. That's when it goes in the deck, or I just start with it because it's common. That happens a lot as well. I do like this card, however, the useful sometimes it's just worthless, right? That will happen, but when it is good, it's pretty solid. Next up, we got Immortal Trade. You apply Lifesteal 3 and Ember Drain 2 to a friendly unit. Okay, this one is one that will help a lot with your boss clearing. It's nice to be able to put permafrost on this and save until you have to clear the boss because if you're not, first off, there's no point in playing this on your morsels like you would with a lot of other Ember Drain cards. So that's not happening. So you're looking to play this on your normal guys. Either you have a way to remove the debuff, which can be nice. I think the only way to do that is if you're pairing them with Melting Remnants. Or you're saving this until the boss, in which case you probably want to freeze it somehow, which would be really nice. The Life Seal 3 does help you tank against the boss much more significantly. However, if your primary tank has either very low attack or they're relying mostly on armor, the Life Seal is not very good. So keep that in mind. Usually, I don't really pick this card. I think it's kind of mediocre. The situations you need in there are too specific, and it really wants an expensive upgrade, which isn't great on a mediocre card. The other situation is if you just somehow happen 
be able to generate enough mana to power through the Ember Drain. That's hard, though. That's really hard, because Ember Drain 2 is a pretty big chunk of mana. That's three mana total that you're losing out on. Really, this is one I never pick up. However, when I do start with it, I'm usually able to milk some value out of it. So it's not the worst thing ever. You can pick it, but there are just way better cards you could be playing with. It, it's the unreliability of it that kind of makes a card mediocre. And with Umbra, adding more unreliable stuff into the deck isn't a good idea because Umbra is already one of the most unreliable things you could be doing. Now we got Pack Morsels. You add three uncommon or rare morsels to your hand. It consumes its zero mana. This card is pretty nice. It's uncommon or rare morsels, so it won't give you rebel morsels. It'll only give you any of the other morsels. It has a chance of giving you morsel miners, which is nice, as well as the excavators and jewelers, which is very nice. This is one that I usually end up with one or two of in the deck. I pick them pretty highly when I have a lot of stuff going on that wants morsels. However, since you're getting all the morsels in one turn, it becomes a bit worse with the, the types of cards that only want like one morsel per turn and adding more to it each turn isn't a huge deal. I mean stuff like Shadow Eater, which is the 050 guy that does AoE damage and heals himself when he gorges. So with cards like that, Pag Morsels isn't as good. However, if you're running stuff like Alloyed Constructs or Crucible Collectors on your upper floors, this becomes a lot better because those cards don't really care about the spacing of their morsels. They care more about just how many morsels they're consuming over the course of the fight, so that's really nice. The efficiency of this card is very high when we compare it to Shade Splitter. It's like six times as efficient because we're spending zero mana for three as compared to one mana for one morsel and the average value of the morsel on the shades player isn't even as good. So I do like this card quite a bit. However, don't take too many of them. This is the thing with Umbra. There, there's this weird balancing line where you need to figure out exactly how many morsels you need and you want to try to get as close to that amount in the deck as possible. If you go too far over it, you're, you're going to be drawing too many morsels a turn, you're going to have nothing to do with them because there's no space. And if you don't draw enough, you're just not going to have the morsels you need to keep your alloyed constructs hitting, to keep your shadow eat, eaters AoE clearing, to keep your gorge tanks alive, and that's no good either. So you really want to hit this fine balance, and that can be really hard to do sometimes. Packed Morsels does help with that considerably because it's just so many morsels for one turn. However, because it is one card and it consumes, the second time through the deck your morsel density is going to be considerably, considerably lower. And that can be a problem sometimes. So do keep that in mind. Additionally, since it is one card and you're getting all your morsels off this one card, it's a lot better with cards like Alloy Construct and Crucible Collector, and it's a lot worse with cards like Shadow Eater. Keep that in mind as well. Next up, we got Perils of Production. This is zero cost. You apply Rage to an Ember Drain 2 to a friendly unit, and you gain two Ember. This is one of the many, many Ember cards that produce Ember for you. The Rage 2 is just kind of there it's not a big deal usually you're gonna be sticking this on a morsel to get free mana and not worry about the ember drain and do a little bit of extra damage it's four extra damage to frontline units which can be a big deal sometimes against a relentless boss this is going to be doing a total of six extra damage to the boss as well as giving you two ember and that's not great either, but it's nice. It's just a, a little bit of an extra boost to push the card up. But most of the time you're going to be sticking this on Morsel, so you don't have to deal with the Ember Drain. So zero mana for two Ember 
this is the kind of effect that you want if either A, you have a lot of card draw, or B, you have really expensive spells. If your deck is already very cheap and you're not having mana problems, don't take this card. Just don't take this card because you're going to draw it and it's going to do nothing because you won't be able to use the extra mana. I, I need to either settle on mana or ember to refer to this because uh, eh, I just don't like the inconsistency, but I'm probably going to keep calling it both for the time being because I don't see myself stopping anytime in the near future. So next up we got Space Prism, zero mana, consume, plus one on this floor. Space Prism is kind of a hard one to evaluate because this is sacrificing a card draw to increase capacity by one on a floor. If you have a lot of card draw, this can be good. If you have major capacity problems, this can also be good. Usually you want to take this if you're having major capacity problems, and it's pretty good there. But then at the same time, you want more card draw because you put this zero mass spell in your deck. And suddenly extra mana becomes less of a consideration because you put this zero mana spell in your deck. So cards like Perils of Production become a bit worse. But really, I might be thinking about this one too hard. You usually end up with this if you start with it or you'll pick it early because you're planning on using a lot of capacity. In those cases, the card's okay. It can help you smooth out your floor plans on Cove 20 plus because the plus one capacity can help you ensure that you're able to set up on the floor you want to and you don't just get ruined by the minus one capacity on a random floor. So this card is pretty nice, but if you don't need the extra capacity or you're really hurting for card draw, I would stay away from this because it doesn't do anything for you in those circumstances and probably makes your deck actively worse. But if you are strained for capacity or you do have a lot of card draw or even better both, then this is a very good card because it helps make sure that you're getting value out of your extra card draw and it helps make sure that you're able to alleviate your capacity situation a bit. Because with Umbra, obviously they're the most capacity-reliant clan, and a lot of the time you'll end up with setups that just require so much capacity that you can't really get fast enough, or you'll end up with setups where you need extra capacity really badly, but you also need extra mana really badly, and when that happens, something like Space Prism can help you take the extra mana off the boss and not get punished for it by your capacity problems. Next up we got Entumbra Assault. This one does 3 damage to a unit for 1 mana, and it adds 2 uncommon or rare morsel units to your hand when it kills something. Keep in mind, you can use this on your own units, so you can use Entumbra Assault on like a Rebel Morsel to turn it into two other Morsels, which are not going to be Rebel Morsels because those are common, but this one is pretty nice. It's really strong in the early game because it helps you pick off annoying backliners like your Spikes dudes or your Haste dudes or what have you, and gives you Morsels in the process. So this is giving you value, and then it's giving you additional value if you use it correctly. By the time you hit the late game, you do want to stick magic power on this so that you can one-shot stuff on the back line from the winged. That's pretty important. And the fact that you're essentially getting a two-for-one out of this card, you're killing a back line, dude, and you're getting morsels out of this is very nice. I usually end up with two, maybe even three of these in most of my Umbra decks because this is just one of their better cards. It's very flexible, it's very versatile, it just does so much for one mana. I highly recommend picking it up. If you're having problems generating enough morsels, this card becomes even better, in fact. Next up we got Shade Splitter. This is the starting card for the clan. It's one mana and it adds a common or uncommon morsel to your hand. Since it's common or uncommon, you cannot get Morsel Miners from this, and you can get Rebel Morsels. 
this card is pretty bad, but it's kind of a necessary evil in a lot of Umbra decks because if you're running stuff like Shadow Eaters, you can't afford to remove your Shade Slayers because you might brick your draw one turn and then just not be able to give your Shadow Eater Gorge, and then it doesn't clear the backline like you need it to, so the backline just moseys on up and starts clearing your frontline units on other floors, and that can be really bad. So this is one where it's a necessary evil. It just helps ensure that you do have morsels when you really need them, but when when you're running lineups that don't really care about morsels, and those do exist, believe me, then this card's very, very bad because it's inconsistent, it's inefficient, and sometimes it just breaks. So that's no good. Shade Splitter, a list of things you can do with it. You can use it to obviously trigger Gorge units, you can use it to buff tanks on other floors, you can use it to block damage, and that's about it. I'm not going to talk too much more about it because it's a pretty self-explanatory card and it's not like you're getting up in a situation where you're picking Shade Splitter. So I'll move on to making a Morsel for 2 mana, you get a Morsel Miner. Unlike the other Morsel cards, this one is very consistent, you know exactly what you're getting. However, 2 mana for plus 5 plus 5 is a little bit meh, especially when that plus 5 plus 5 has the added downside of dying to sweep that can really screw you sometimes. The clear comparison is the Steel Enhancer. It's a bit less efficient than Steel Enhancer, however, if you're able to use Gorge Triggers with this, it's a bit more efficient. They're both kind of mediocre cards, however. This does have some nice combos, though. If you can combo this with any ways to multiply your morsels, then this does become quite a bit better because multiplying Morsel Miners is very good. So if you have like a Morsel Master, which we'll get to later, this can become a lot better. Or uh, Shroud Mitosis, it also makes it a lot better. So that's really nice. However, this card's kind of mediocre. The two mana is a bit steep. However, if it only costs one mana, the card would be way too good. So take this if you just need another way to get morsels really uh, that's gonna be the way it is with a lot of these morsel cards also since it's just one card that gives one morsel it doesn't take up that much capacity and it helps you ensure that you can get a way to get a morsel in every hand which helps a lot with cards like shadow eater which i keep bringing up and don't worry, we'll get to Shadow Eater eventually. He's a very important card. So making a Morsel average, maybe a little bit below average, but you can't expect a ton from a common card. It does have some nice combos, which, which can make it better. And it, it's, just, it's just okay. Sometimes you'll take it, sometimes you'll leave it. Let's move on to the uncommon cards. Prism Retrieval. Uh, this one's kind of comparable to, uh, what's it called? To, damn it, I forgot what the card's called, but the Channel Song, Channel Song. It's comparable to Channel Song. It's probably a little bit worse than Channel Song because the stats you're going to get off it are almost certainly going to be nowhere near as good. Uh, it consumes, you draw a unit, enhance it with plus 5 attack and minus X Ember cost. Umbra can get some use out of this. Sometimes you'll be fishing up like a morsel. You shuffle back into the deck with, with this, which isn't very good. But sometimes you can use this to help smooth out your draw, which can be really nice. You can cast it for 0 just to get a unit out of the deck when you need it. I think this is one that is kind of not a huge deal to put in the deck since it's uncommon set of rare usually, well not usually, sometimes this will just be next to two cards you really don't care about, in which case you can take it and it'll be alright because you're essentially just using this to tutor up a unit, which can be very important sometimes. The plus 5 attack does come up sometimes, however, it's not why we're here. We're just here to use the 
unit tutor. And sometimes that's relevant, sometimes it's not. It's really just up to you. Sometimes this can help smooth out your draw if something weird happens and you draw too many core units in one turn. Let's play them all. You can use this to fish up the one that you weren't able to play later in the first deck cycle, so it can help you smooth that out a little bit. But other than that, the card's kind of mediocre. It's really inoffensive but the effect just doesn't do a ton. Now we got Ember Cash. So zero mana consume and you add three excavated embers to your discard pile. Excavated embers are where are they? They are these stinkers right here. Zero mana consume gain two ember and you draw one. So how good is this? First off, you're sacrificing card draw when you play this. Uh, you have to play the Ember Cache, so you're losing card there, and all of the Excavated Embers don't really give you draw card card draw because you have to play the ex not play you have to draw the Excavated Embers. So the card you're drawing off the Embers is just the card you would have drawn anyway if you had not put the Ember in your deck. So that can be kind of awkward. So we're really just here for the mana. If you're really strapped on mana, the Ember Cache can be very good. Also, if you're playing Stygian, this is also really good because it's really good with Encant. You're, you're playing the 0 mana Ember Cache, which triggers Encant. Then the second cycle through your deck, you're getting 3 of these Embers, which triggers Encant 3 more times for free, essentially. So that's really, really good. It's very good with Stygian. With other clans, is it's more questionable because you need to really want the mana. If you don't really want the mana, then this isn't that good. However, Umbra does have a lot of expensive cards. So this can be really good. Now we got Feast. Zero mana trigger feeding on Morsel units. This is one that's just so awkward to use. I rarely ever pick this because the situations where it's good are just so few and far between. Usually the card just doesn't do anything. When it does do something, what it does is super underwhelming. This is another one where if you're strapped for card draw, stay far away from this card. It's just too unimpactful. If you are going to take this, you probably want to put something like Permafrost on it, or you want to be in a situation where you're really strapped for capacity, but you have a lot of morsels. If that's the situation, then this card can be pretty decent, but otherwise, don't bother. Feast is not very good. Definitely well below average in terms of number of cards. Here we got Magma Morsel. Or, oh, no, we already talked about Magma Morsel. Let's move on to Void Binding. You apply damage for zero mana, you apply damage shield 2, rage 6, and ember drain 3. You want to put this on. Well, actually, there's a few situations for this. The first and most obvious one is you stick a morsel in front, you put the Void Binding on it, it eats the 2 damage shield. Sometimes it dies because it'll take 3 hits. But if it does survive, it gets to do 12 damage, which is pretty nice. That's probably the best use case of this, and the most common one, just using it to tank more damage and maybe do a little bit of extra damage. Sometimes you really just need the extra damage, so you'll stick this on a morsel in the back lines so that it doesn't die, and it's able to get the extra 12 damage off. The other use case is you use this on the boss phase of the fight on either a frontline dude if it's a normal boss or a backline dude if it's a sweeping boss and you really need the backliner to survive. And in that case, it's really good. If they get to use the full 6 rage, that is uh, 21 extra damage. The damage shield 2 helps considerably to hold off most bosses. There are some bosses who can just be right through it though. But this is one that you especially want to make sure the dude is dying that turn. Because if the dude doesn't die that turn, or the fight doesn't end that turn, Ember Drain 3 is just crippling. 
You do not want to deal with Ember Drain 3. It's really bad. I think this card's pretty good. It helps keep stuff alive. Sometimes it helps helps push out a little damage. It helps with bosses. Really, it's just a little bit of everything. It's helping three of your core requirements to win the run. Defensiveness, offensiveness, and boss killing capability for zero mana. I think this card's pretty good. Usually I'll take it if I see it, unless there's something really nice next to it. Cannibalize. One mana, you sacrifice a dude, you get three uncommon rare morsels. Usually you're just using this on a morsel itself to turn that morsel into three morsels. Kind of like a... Where is it? What am I doing? Kind of like... Pack morsels. This one is one that is kind of... It's kind of like... You need to have a high density of morsel cards in your deck for this to be good. But this produces a ton of morsels as well. It's a super inconsistent card. It helps to freeze this because then you can ensure you have it when it's good. But if you don't have it when it's good, like sometimes you'll draw this, but you'll just have no ways to make morsels. And then it's just a dead draw. And that really sucks. Sometimes you'll draw this and a ton of other morsel stuff and you won't have enough room for all the morsels, so that also kind of sucks. This is one, like I said towards the start of the video, there's a very fine balancing act with Umbra. You need to have just enough morsel generation stuff in the deck for it to be good. This is one that pushes that to an extreme. If you have too many morsels, the card's bad. If you don't have enough morsels, the card's also bad. If you have just enough morsel and capacity for this to be good, the card's really good. So this is one where you need to hit that fine balance, that sweet spot for the cards to be really good. If you can't hit that, the card sucks. Crucible Collector. Uh, this card is overrated. There, I said it. Sue me. But Crucible Collector, 1 mana, 2020, 20, you gain 1 lifesteal when it gorges. So the, the problem with this is it wants to be on a floor by itself, and it wants a lot of morsels. So when you take the Crucible Collector, you're essentially saying, okay, I'm going to dedicate a whole floor to just this guy, and I'm going to go deep in on more souls and that's going to be a major part of my game plan. The problem is that these kind of floors just don't do a whole lot. You can't put much behind the Crucible Collector because he demands so much space for his more souls. You can't put Multi-Strike on him so his damage potential is kind of lacking because put multi-strike on him, he's going to lose two lifesteal every turn instead of one. So that's no good. And you're sacrificing a different unit you could take instead to put this guy in the deck. He is pretty alright killing bosses, but that's already one of Umbra's big strong points. Their biggest weak point is dealing with tanky frontline units. And this doesn't really help you do that at all. It just doesn't do enough damage to help with that. It doesn't help to keep your backliners alive because you can't stick it in front of a couple backliners because there won't be room for morsels. The card is very good at killing bosses, but the resource investment just to kill a boss on this guy when you're playing Umbra means you're probably going to die to Gilded Wings. I'll take this sometimes if there's just nothing better I can pick. But usually I won't be very happy about it. Overall, this was a card that was very, very good at lower covenants. But as I started getting higher and higher, this card just started falling off hard. And lately, it's just been really disappointing. Every time I take it, it's just this huge pain in the ass to deal with. You gotta give it a ton of morsels. 
So you gotta pick more morsels, which makes your deck more inconsistent. And you're dumping a ton of resources into this thing, and it's not even helping you that much with your biggest weak points. So I don't like this card much at all. Now we got Crucible Warden, which kind of suffers from the same problem as Crucible Collector. However, unlike the Collector, you can put Multi-Strike on this guy and it will be fine. So, the thing is, after giving this a ton of thought, I think Crucible Warden might just be slightly better than Crucible Collector. And I know a lot of people are going to be outraged that I, I've said this thing, that, that I've spoken this heresy. But hear me out. Because this has damage shield instead of lifesteal, you get to put multi-strike on it without getting punished. You stick this on a higher floor, and usually by the time stuff gets to that higher floor, it's just going to be one tanky boy. That one tanky boy is only going to hit the Crucible Warden once, so the lifesteal will have been just as effective as the damage shield. He does only have 10 HP, which is kind of crappy, but what can you do? But the Crucible Warden, unlike the Crucible Collector, you get to put Multi-Strike on it, so he can actually do a good, a good job at chunking these tanky frontline dudes without sacrificing any of his defense, which is really great. So after playing with both these cards a lot over the past while, I concluded that Crucible Warden is actually slightly better than Crucible Collector. On paper, the Collector is way better, but in practice, because the Warden has access to Multi-Strike, he's just a little bit better because being able to put multi-strike on him just helps with the damage so much more than not being able to put multi-strike and that's a huge deal at higher covenant because you need a ton of damage to deal with the damn gilded wings and the damn clip cars and, and dark wings and all the other crap so yeah i said it i said it people are going to disagree with me people are probably going to say stuff comments but this is just the way it is crucible warden is slightly better than crucible collector now we got ember forge one mana zero twenty four capacity you get plus two ember per turn i've never won with this card i've played with this card like seven eight plus times I never pick this card. Uh, it always ends up starting in the deck, and every time I've had it, the card has just been complete garbage. It's too big to stick in front of anything, so you're going to want to stick this on a floor by itself. The plus two Ember per turn is very nice, but uh, also, before I say anything else, I should mention this counts as a token unit, so you won't get it as your guaranteed unit draw. On a turn but the problem is we're turning our capacity into extra mana umbra is a faction that has it really wants both but it's really strapped for capacity and it has a lot of good ways to generate mana so having this brick that you just put somewhere it takes up pretty much the whole floor, and it's giving you just ember. You've sacrificed an entire floor to gain ember. On other factions that are not umbra, this could be pretty decent. But since you're umbra, you're going to want to be using all three floors. If you're not using all three floors, then... You're just wasting capacity, which is your biggest asset, your biggest limiting factor. How much capacity can I get? I, I always need more capacity, and Ember Forge just ruins that. Because you're throwing away your capacity to get extra Ember. 
and the ember sometimes doesn't end up being important anyway. It's nice to have, but it's not nice enough to sacrifice for capacity, and it does nothing the turn you play it, which also kind of sucks. But yeah, the card's just not very good. I don't recommend playing with it. It's just so disappointing. It's good on paper, but in practice, when you put it next to all these other cards, it's just so it's just so disappointing. Next up we got engine upgrade, which is kind of like Ember Forge, but not as bad. It, it's one mana, it consumes, it reduces your capacity on a floor by one, and it gives you plus one ember per turn for the rest of the battle. This is an obvious comparison to Ember Forge, but this one we're gaining just plus one mana, but we're only sacrificing one capacity. That's a huge difference. Plus two ember is going to be overkill a lot of time. Plus one ember is usually going to come up. And minus one capacity is way, way less punishing than minus four capacity. And if it dies, you lose the extra ember. Sometimes... Oh, also, th this is one of the big things with this. You can use this on a floor that's already at full capacity and it won't change anything. Whereas with the Ember Forge, if the floor is already at full capacity, you, you can't play it. You have to for sure use the capacity up on a floor. This one, you just play it on a floor that's already at full capacity and it's pretty decent. It's one that if... It's another one where you want it if you have a lot of card draw. If you have a lot of card draw and you need mana, this is a good card. If you don't have a ton of card draw and you don't really need mana, card's bad, but you just don't take it in that case. I think this card's pretty decent. I've had some mild success with it. It's not the greatest card. It's probably around average to slightly above average, depending on, on the deck. But it's an okay card. You can get some good mileage out of it. Next up, we got Morsel Master. One mana, 10 10. When you summon Morsel, you know, as floor, create a copy. This one can go over the capacity limit on floors with Morsels. So keep that in mind. The one mana, 10 10 does mean this is pretty much the only DPS backline that's. Umbra have access to besides Penumbra himself. So that's really interesting. Let's start by talking about the stats here. 1 mana, 10, 10. It's not a great body, but it is a body. Sometimes the extra damage will come up. Just having that little extra push could mean the difference between killing that Gilded Wing and having it do 10 damage to the Pyre, which really sucks. So the 10, 10 body does come up pretty often. 10 health does end up being a little bit on the low end. Usually you're going to want to stick some sort of defensive upgrade on this to protect it from sweepers because it could die to those. It probably won't, but the possibility is there. So something like a battle stone is really nice on him. Or just a damage shield upgrade and then an attack upgrade is going to be really nice on him. The extra damage does help more often than you would think because Umbra is just so strapped for damage to begin with. So the Morsel Duplication. Usually you're going to want to use this on a floor where you have something like a Crucible Warren or Crucible Collector or Alloy Construct that really, really wants a lot of morsels. It's not that great with stuff like Shadow Eater, however, if you're having to deal with Absolvers in the later stages of the game, which are the 10 health guys who stick self mutilations in your deck, the Morsel Master can help with that because you can put him behind the Shadow Eater and do morsels with him so he can do 10 damage off just one morsel draw. I think he is a pretty solid unit. He does help quite a bit with the morsel situation, however, you do need to make sure that you have enough morsels in the deck to get use out of this. If you don't, the card's no good, but if you do, he's pretty decent. 
being able to go over capacity with the morsels off him is really nice and sometimes with the morsel master you can go you, well you can hit the unit limit on floors which can be a little bit of an, an of an annoyance but it's it's a necessary evil so the card is pretty decent sometimes you want it sometimes you don't it's probably slightly above average in terms of number of cards just because of how it helps smooth out your draw and helps you just a little bit with everything you care about. Next up we got Alloyed Construct. It's inert, meaning it can only attack if it has fuel. It's got Multi-Strike 1. It has Gorge Gain 1 fuel. It's a 25-25, and it costs 2 mana and takes up 2 spaces. This is, in my opinion, one of the better Gorge units Umber have access to. Just because, like I said with Crucible Warden, Umbra sucks at single target damage. And this is one of your best options for single target damage. The base attack value on this without any upgrades equates to 50 damage. If you put more attack upgrades or more multi-strike on him, he can do even more damage. But the caveat, of course, is you need to keep him fueled up. So you do need to be able to produce a lot of morsels. He's... Another one of these cards that kind of emphasizes the inconsistency of Umbra because sometimes you'll just break your draw and he'll run out of fuel. You won't be able to give him more fuel and then stuff's just going to run right past him and straight to the pyre and that always sucks. Usually you're going to want to set him up on the top floor so that you have time to get him fueled up. If you can't set him up on the top floor, he can sometimes just be a brick that does nothing and that sucks. But when you do hit that sweet spot of morsels in the deck, he's really good because of just the sheer amount of damage he can put out against frontliners is really important. I don't have much else to say about him. I do think the card's quite good. I take it fairly often, but sometimes it just doesn't work out if I can't hit that sweet spot with the morsels. Next up we got cave in it descends everyone on the floor for two mana this is an interesting card because it's one that kind of it's kind of at odds with the whole morsel game plan usually what i end up doing with this is i stick permafrost on it and use it for the boss and that can be really good or i just use it in setups that don't care that much about morsels, that can be really good as well. There's not too much to talk about the card because I'm not going to talk about this ascend descend stuff again in too much depth because I've already talked about it during the Hellhorn and Awoken videos, so there's not too much more I can say about it. But descend strats and ascend strats are pretty good, they're a very good way of ensuring you kill the boss and minimizing the damage you take to your frontline units. It's a little bit worse in Umbra, like I said, because of the whole morsel game plan going on. However, this does help you in some ways of getting around capacity requirements because if you use this like fairly early in the fight to descend some stuff from the top line to mid line and then you put more stuff on top line that cares about gorge you can use it that way, but that's kind of hard to pull off. Usually, I'll just put permafrost on this and use it to kill the boss, and that's fine. Next up is Crucible Extension. Two mana, plus one on this floor. This is another one that's converting one resource into another, kind of like Engine Upgrade and Ember Forge. This one, however, is converting mana and card draw into capacity. So kind of the opposite of engine upgrade and ember forge. It's okay, but you need a lot of mana and a lot of card draw to justify this. Usually you're going to be playing this at most twice during a fight. Comparing it to space prism, most of the time I would just much rather have this because with this one I only I'm only converting card draw into capacity, which is a lot easier to deal with with Crucible extension, the fact it costs 2 mana is a huge deal. You 
can stick upgrades on this to make it cheaper, but you could put those on other spells instead. I don't think the card's bad per se, it's just really hard to make it good when Space Prism exists. Most times you're going to be using this once, maybe twice during a fight. So the comparison there means that Space Prism is pretty clearly better, like most of the time. There is some meme -y stuff you can do with this, like putting hold over on it, but I don't know why you would want to do that. It It's making your mana and card draw situation even worse if you do that. There's just easier ways to get capacity, like like Space Prism, and that's common compared to Uncommon. uncommon. Usually I stay away from this one. I don't think Crucible Extension is very good, so I wouldn't take it very highly. Next up we got Grovel. Two mana applies damage shield one to a unit and adds two uncommon or rare moral swings to your hand. This one's pretty strong. Two mana is a little bit steep, but if it costs one mana it would just be way too powerful. Damage shield one is usually going to end up eating like... 10 damage, maybe more, maybe less. It just depends. And the two morsels you're getting, they're uncommon or rare, so you can't get rebel morsels. You can get morsel miners. It's just a really high impact card most of the time. It's one that helps with your morsel situation if you need it, but again, if you already have too much morsel collection, the card or generation, the card becomes way worse. If you don't have enough, the card becomes way better. I think it's pretty solid. It's one of the better morsel producing cards. I'll take it a lot of the time, not always. There's not too much else to talk about here. It's just another way of producing morsels. So I'm just going to move on to the next card, which is Morsel Maker. This one is... It's... It's a very complex card because there's a few ways you can use this. The first and most obvious way to use this is you stick in the back line and you use it to feed your morsel generators. Uh, one moment, please. I need to plug my laptop in. Okay, anyway, as I was saying, Morsel Maker, primary way to use this, most people use it this way. You stick in the back and use it to generate morsels for a gorge unit up front. That's okay, but it's not that great. It's pretty inefficient. You better have a really good gorge trigger if you're going to use it that way. Because it's, it's two mana. It's pretty much saying you can't put other morsels on this floor. And it's only generating... And Tumbra Morsels and Magma Morsels, which are plus 3 attack and plus 3 HP, so that's not a very good stat boost. However, not too long ago, I found another way to use Morsel Maker. You stick him in front and use the Morsels he produces to tank for you. It's essentially like a 2 mana, 0 10 who you stick in front, and every turn he gets damage shield 2, and if he doesn't use up all the damage shield, he gets stats boost. And then you can put, like, plus HP upgrades on him, or what have you. So that's actually a pretty decent way to use him. The biggest issue with the card is the 2 mana cost. However, if it costs 1 mana, it would probably be too strong as a tank. I think using him as a tank is a very interesting idea. It's one I've played around with quite a bit, and it can be quite potent sometimes because it just hard counters certain enemies. However, there are other enemies that hard counter the Morsel Maker when you use it this way, like Sweep Dudes, just clear out the Morsels, but they were going to counter Morsel Maker either way. I think... The card can be quite good, but you need to make sure you have the mana to actually put into this. If you are planning on using Morsel Maker at all, I do recommend picking up extra mana at some point. 
and I do also really recommend experimenting with using it as a tank because I think it's quite good just the fact that it can completely bypass all the trash damage that's getting thrown at because it's essentially gaining damage shield to every turn is really really good so keep that in mind next up we got the shadow eater one that I brought up quite a bit one moment so shadow eater two mana zero fifty gorge restores five health and deals five damage to enemy units this card's really good because it's the only way that umbra can reliably do aoe damage you stick this on the bottom floor it's 0 50 it has a huge back end so it's not going to die too easily and it heals itself which makes it even more resilient and you throw one morsel every turn down there and he just clears the back line every turn and that's really good and then if you can put some nice upgrades on him get him like a large stone plus 25 HP the extra stats from the morsels on top of that sometimes he can actually take a pretty big chunk out of the boss as well when they show up because he can heal really easily because of his gorge trigger I think this is probably the second best gorge unit in the game if we consider overgorge which we'll get to in a moment but I think this is one of Umbra's best cards it's a very reliable well, it's a fairly reliable way to do AoE damage and clear out backliners sometimes you will brick with it though and you just won't have the morsels when you need it which is why I keep bringing up this sweet spot with the morsels that you need you need to hit it's really important for cards like Shadow Eater which is one of the better cards Umbra has access to. So I highly recommend playing with this card. I I feel like a lot of people just don't pick this because the they're comparing it to stuff like Crucible War and a Crucible Collector, and that's just not the way to look at this card. It's not comparable to those at all. You throw this on the bottom, you use it for AoE, and that's it. You're not using this to try to kill the boss or to try to kill frontliners. That's not what it's for. Now we got Excavation Eruption. It's four mana, so you need to produce extra mana somehow to play this. Deals 20 damage to a random enemy unit four times, and it has Slay, Gain to Ember. This is one that's actually pretty solid in my opinion. You can use this you can stick some minus cost upgrades on this and use this on floors that have a lot of backline stuff and sometimes you'll gain mana off that as in you'll pay like three mana for the excavation eruption and you'll get four mana back and that can be really nice it's one of their better cards in my opinion it's 80 damage for four mana which isn't great but the fact that it can refund the mana makes it a pretty spectacular card it's one I highly recommend picking. It's done a lot of great work with me. It's very good in split anvil builds. It's very good in uh it's very, very good in volatile gauge builds. Not much else to say about the card. The RNG on it does make the card a little bit worse, but that's kind of a necessary evil. And now we got Gem Trove. Unlike Excavation Eruption, I do think the 4 mana on Gem Trove just kind of kills the card. Gives damage shield 1 to friendly units on the floor and adds 3 uncommon or rare morsels to your hand. That's a pretty powerful effect, but 4 mana for this is really steep. You can reduce the cost, but eh, I, I think when we compare it to Gravel, it's just not that good. If you are running like a Volatile Gauge or a Split Anvil build, the card is obviously very good. But outside of situations, the 4 mana is just a bit much. And it's one that I don't take very highly. I, I have used it and I have had success with it. But I just think it's average to slightly below average in terms of Umber cards. 
the damage shield to the back line as well as the front line can help you deal with sweepers. The morsels are nice, but since we're getting all the morsels in one turn, this is no good with Shadow Eater. If it's just Shadow Eater, and it does increase your morsel density by a ton. Next up, let's look at the rare cards, the first of which is Forever Consumed. Forever consumes the Consumed deals 30x damage to the front enemy unit. That's uh, that's okay if you have something going on with spell power because you're Stygian, it can be a really good card. If you have lots of ways of producing mana, it can be a really good card. If you have the one artifact that adds plus three to X values, it's a really good card. Overall, it's, it's just kind of plain, though. You pump mana into this, and it does damage to the front. That's all it does. Uh, the card's okay. I'll usually take it if I'm not interested in any of the other stuff I'm being offered at the time. But it's not like a build-around card. It's just an okay card. It's a above average. There isn't a ton to say about it. So I'm just going to move on to Kindle now. X... Cost consumes and you gain 2x ember. I've never won with this card. It's probably because usually I don't take this card because it turns out that Umbra actually has really good rare cards on average, which is interesting. But Kindle, the problem with Kindle is usually you're going to draw this when you don't. So you need to put something like permafrost on it to make it good. So that's already kind of a knock off the card, and it also converts card draw directly to mana. And Umbra already has a lot of other ways to produce mana, so usually if I really need mana, I'll have found other ways to generate mana by the time I find Kindle, which will make the Kindle worse. It's not a bad card, but usually it just doesn't come up. Usually the extra mana just isn't necessary. There are some neat combos you can do with this, like pairing it with other X cost spells to do some really crazy stuff, but that just seems more like a pipe dream than something you'd realistically be doing. You can pick this card, it's not bad if you need more mana. But if you don't need more Ember, then, well, it is just okay. It's not the worst thing ever, but sometimes it will just be a dead draw. If you need card draw more than mana, this is definitely a stay far away from card. Now we got Shroud Spike. Another X cost. It consumes. You kill a morsel and trigger Ian and Gorge Billies as if it had been eaten two X times. This is one that's a really nice combo enabler, and if you have a lot of stuff going on with morsels and you have a lot of ways to generate mana, it can be very powerful. If you use this on like a uh, what's a, a morsel miner, that's really good. But you do need ways to make sure that this is going to be good, because if you don't have good ways to use this, it's going to be a dead card. It also suffers a bit from the same problem as Cannibalize, because if you don't have enough ways to produce morsels, this can just break hard. We looked at Morsel Miner already, so Wretch is up next. For zero mana, we're returning Consume Morsels to the hand. This is a very good card. It's a very, very good card, but you do need a lot of capacity for this to be good. Because you don't want to be shuffling those morsels back in. That would be suboptimal to say the least. But if you do have high morsel requirements, Wretch is an absurdly powerful card. And I I've already talked a lot about all these morsel generation cards there's not much else I can go into with Wretch unfortunately so I'm gonna move on to Shroud Mitosis. Shroud Mitosis is another one that like the Morsel Master can go over capacity so that's nice 
like the shroud spike it's very good if you have really high impact morsels like morsel miners however also like the shroud spike and like cannibalize it's very very bad if you brick with it and you can brick with it these are very similar cars it's actually very very similar to shroud spike it's slightly different but you take shroud mitosis all the same time as you take shroud spike really so yeah i don't have a ton else to say about it you can use this to tank more damage with your morsels as well which can be relevant in some cases you can like throw a rubble morsel in front of something and then crowd mitosis it and that will block four instances of damage which can be very relevant but other than that it's kind of the same situation as crowd spike and shroud mitosis and cannibalize of which shroud mitosis and shroud spike are roughly on par with each other and cannibalize is worse than either of them now we got furnace top this is uh this is one hell of a card it consumes it costs two you apply rage four and multi-strike one as well as ember drain four the ember drain can be a really big problem with this one you don't really care to stick this on a morsel because it doesn't make sense. What's the morsel going to do? Kill the enemy frontliner with their rage 4 and multi strike 1? They're going to do what? Like 20 damage at the most? That's not that good. So you're looking to put this on your primary DPS units. But hold on. This is giving you Ember Drain 4. That's a lot of Ember Drain. That's like essentially saying you're not going to have mana for most of the rest of the fight. And it becomes even worse if you stick double stack on it, because the double stack affects the Ember Drain as well. So now you're playing Ember Drain 8, which means you're almost certainly not going to have mana for the rest of the fight. So how do we use this? You use this to kill bosses. And that's pretty much it. You can use this outside of boss fights, if you're really confident that you won't need to cast anything for the next couple turns but that's risky as hell so we're mostly using this for boss fights you want to stick permafrost on this double stacks also a really good option if you're using it that way because then we're getting just we're getting more juice out of the rage and multi-strike and using it in this way it's gonna do very well against bosses but it's not that relevant because Umbra's already very good at killing bosses. So the other way we're using this is in combination with stuff that cleanses debuffs, which is going to be cars from Melting Remnant, who we haven't gone over yet, so we'll save those for later. That's the other way you're using this, and it can be very good that way. In fact, it's very, very good if you can pull that off, but it's... A really tough combo to pull off because you need to put permafrost on something either this or the cleanse cards and the cleanse cards are on the higher rarities one of them's rarity other ones uh, uncommon so they can be hard to find and if you're trying to do this you're looking for multiple cards of higher rarities so it can happen but it's not guarantee it at all in fact it's really uncommon to find the, these together so we're mostly using this for bosses we can get really lucky and find a way to cleanse the debuff which can be really good but yeah mostly for bosses now we got overgorger two mana three capacity zero 15 gorge gain plus two attack permanently this is one you want to find in the early game so that you can start stacking up attack on it. Usually I'll pick this up if I find it right after the Deadless fight or even before the, the Deadless fight. But once we start getting near Fell, this it's just a bit too late for Overgorger. If you do find the Overgorger, the game plan is usually to try as hard as you can 
to beat at morsels up until we get to the fights against the winged, at which point we want to transition it into a backliner that we stick behind the tank somewhere. You're looking for multi-strike on this, as well as probably a way to help its pitiful HP pool. Multi-strike obviously because it's going to be hitting very, very hard later on, and plus HP because it only has 15 HP, which is not a ton, and it has no ways to defend itself outside of whatever buffs it's getting from the morsels. But yeah, try to find this early, pick it up if you find it really early, feed morsels into it to buff that attack up and up and up, and then in the late game stick it in the back line behind something so that you can use it as a reliable DPS that won't die to some bullshit. It's also really good against the bosses when you use it this way because you put it behind a tank and then it shreds the boss and you don't have to worry about the overgorger dying. Umbra Stone. Umbra Stone is 2 mana, consume, and apply trample. That's okay. Uh, the 2 mana is a little bit steep and the trample isn't going to be useful all the time. In fact, I would go as far as saying trample isn't useful most of the time. You need a unit that has very, very high attack for this to be good. And hopefully, you're not trying to use this clear out backliners because that's just not a reliable game plan. Usually, you're going to use this to splash extra damage onto a frontliner, like a second frontliner that the enemies throw out. And that can be okay, but I think there's just better cards than this. The impact isn't terribly high. There, there's like some stuff you can do with sweepers, but that's more of a meme than anything. I don't think Umbra Stone's very good. It's definitely below average. I wouldn't take it over most of these other cards because, like I said, Umbra does actually have some very good rare cards like Shroud Spike, Wretch, Shroud Mitosis, Forever Consumes, pretty good. Uh, and here's Blazing Bolts. Three mana, it purges. You deal 30 damage to the front enemy units and add a stronger version of this to your discard. This caps out at the fourth time. So after a fourth time you play this, this is 3 mana, consume, deal 30 damage to the front enemy unit four times. It's an okay card. It does help quite a bit with clearing out the tanky frontline units, but you need to draw this pretty early. Well, you need to get this fairly early in a run. I wouldn't take this in the late game. 3 mana is a bit steep. I believe it does retain its upgrades over the purge cycles. And the damage can be really good in the late game. It's 120 damage to front units. There's not tons to talk about with this card. It's just frontline damage that scales and eventually caps out after a 4 time it scales up. Uh, the card's good. I take it sometimes. Sometimes I don't take it. I would take it more often if it weren't in competition with stuff like Wretch and Overgorger and Shroud Mitosis and all this other stuff. But the card's okay. I'd say it's just like slightly above average. It's much better if you can find it early because that way you don't have to play this brick against the Clipped and have it just be awful. I recommend sticking one minus cost upgrade and one plus magic power upgrade on this and that's a pretty decent card once you get it maxed out finally we have big man himself shadow siege six mana five capacity 200 attack 150 health that's it has no abilities so shadow siege is a very high rolly card Either you find a way to get Shadow Siege into play, or you don't. If you don't find a way to get him into play, he's just a brick in your deck that's not doing anything. It's essentially a dead weight. Oh, and it eats up your guaranteed unit draw of a turn when you're not able to cast it. If you are able to cast it, then it just wins the game. 
that's it. Shadow Siege wins the game if you get into play. So, good ways of getting this into play. There are a few. There are a few ways to get this into play. The first and most obvious one is Voltal Gauge. Uh, if you get Voltal Gauge, Shadow Siege suddenly becomes this absurd powerhouse. If you get Flicker's Liquor, it becomes very, very easy to get into play. Uh, there's some Hellhorned and Umbra stuff that you can use to gener generate a lot of mana to get this into play, so that's really nice if you manage to pull that off. Umbra specifically has a lot of good ways to get this into play, which we went over earlier in the video. Like, uh, Kindle gets into play, the Excavate Embers can help, Perils of Production can help quite a bit, etc, etc. So that can help quite a bit. The event where you run into the clergyman who asks you to, to give him something and then later on he gives it back to you upgraded, if you give him the Shadow Siege, there's a chance that he will upgrade it to be endless and cost zero. If you do get that, it's very, very good. And you probably just win the runoff that because at that point you can probably just duplicate this and it's good enough. And speaking of that event with Shadow Siege, if you draft the Shadow Siege and you have no way to get him into play yet, you can give him to that dude and just let him hold on to it while you try to find a way to get the Shadow Siege into play so that you don't have to deal with having the card in your deck during that time frame. Really, I think the potential on Shadow Siege is good enough that if I see it in the early game, uh, I'm just going to take it and try to find a way to get into play. If I don't find a way to get into play, uh, that sucks. But the potential, the ceiling on this card is so absurdly high that I can't not try, right? I have to try. And if it works out, great. If it doesn't work out, oh well. But yeah, if you do find a way to reliably resolve Shadow Siege, the card will just carry the run by itself, especially if you stick like Multi-Strike on it. Multi-Strike quick or something like that. It just shreds everything. So that does it for all the Umbra cards. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time when we go over the Melting Remnant cards. Not looking forward to going through the Melting Remnant cards because they're, uh, I, I have some, some problems with Melting Remnants that we'll get into when we go over those cards. But anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.